Uh, very big thing to pay attention to on your screen is who's starting. Uh, and looking at BBD's clock, that's where we're at. Yeah, this seems this seems like a pretty good opening hand for Spike at least. Urza Saga, definitely the strongest threat in this matchup because uninteractable by the game one interaction out of BBD. I mean, you say that. I see Spell Pierce. I see Prismatic Ending. I see four amulets of Vigor, though, right? We got two amulets and two of the Saga. All four of the amulets can come out to play. Yeah, and it's again, exactly against those Spell Pierces that these other Sagas are really strong, where they're both a very strong threat, but also they uncounterably put an amulet into play. And there's not really much counterplay game one from BBD. Sure, the Prismatic Ending can take care of amulets when they come down, but the really important thing about this deck is that first turn that amulet comes down, you can really leverage that to get a lot of mana and get ahead. So the Prismatic Ending on amulet, often slightly too late. And we saw Aspiring Spike wait a turn, right, trying to play around. Uh, not so much Spell Pierce is only one in the list, but more Prismatic Ending. Uh, so plays two, gets hit by the Spell Pierce here before passing the turn. I, I would suspect Teferi here, Arya, but uh, what are the merits of both Code and Teferi? Uh, I think Teferi, what Code does better is it starts applying some pressure, which is pretty important. But I think Teferi is kind of crucial here because there's clearly no bounce land. Otherwise, Spike could have played an amulet on one. And that means you really want to delay Spike getting something like an expedition map and being able to bound, uh, being able to like get his old mana engine going. Right. Uh, so so the, also these lands are slated to disappear. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, <laughs> if it's, um, you know, uh, it's I think expedition map allows to, to kind of uh, stay in. But yeah, the as as we see here, BBD highlighting that prismatic ending. Definitely targeting the Amulet of Vigor, and I would imagine here this is the time to slam down that Cryptic Code and put on a clock, or do you think we're going to see a second Teferi on Urza Saga? I wouldn't be surprised to see a second Teferi. That makes sure that no Amulet comes down this turn and just really delays Spike's development. But Cryptic Code also means, well, uh, BBD has got to win the game at some point, and Cryptic Code does a lot to start applying pressure here. By the way, what a draw here from Aspiring Spike. Gets that Golgari Rot Farm, getting probably now, uh, an, I would guess, yes, the Amulet of Vigor. And we have our Brolial Grazer. Uh, I mean, I've heard the name uh, Mox Monkey. <laughs> but, you know, before, <laughs> Mox Monkey was something very specific, eating the Moxes. And this one is, or, or Diamond Monkey, right? Uh, call back to uh, Mox Diamond specifically. Uh, because that combination between, wow, the fourth Amulet just off the top as well. Yeah, the that that fourth amulet's gonna be really important. It's hard to start going up a lot of mana with a Boral Grazer and Golgari Rot Farm, specifically because Grazer uh is gonna take that green mana out of Rot Farm. So amulet means Spike gets to start going up green mana, casting stirrings while he's grazering, and that puts him in really good shape, I think. By the way, interesting uh choice here from Aspiring Spike to do kind of a, a construct token. So uh, is, th is this a respect for Teferi here? Yeah, I also think it gives BBD yet another thing to deal with. The construct means the construct means Teferi can't just sit around threateningly for a while. And this, playing out another amulet doesn't really do anything, since there's going to be that free colorless mana next turn to play out the amulet anyway. There's no real rush to bring it down. So this way, uh, Spike gets to pressure the Teferi a little for basically free and still have the ability to develop the second amulet next turn all right but by the way on i mean we are seeing all four amulets of vigor right Two, one's exiled one's in the graveyard uh one's in play and one's in hand uh obviously we don't play hedron alignment for that kind of win condition but <laughs> uh, i mean with counter spell in hand we're not far from seeing all of the amulets of vigor gone and others spike, can spike win without any of them left uh, yes, but it's very difficult. The nice thing about these amulet decks is you can just play a little bit like a ramp deck and slowly develop your mana and try and eventually get to casting your big spells. But with the Cryptic Coat and the Stoneforge Mystic in play, uh, I would say it comes down to whether Spike can keep this one amulet sticking around. And by the way, as well, uh, we, we didn't talk about what Stoneforge Mystic got, but the Caldra Complete there makes kind of some sense, right? Because damage good uh but yeah no it seems like 
you're right. It's like BBD had a few different things to do. So like, that's why the, as you mentioned, right, the cryptic code creature didn't attack for that reason. Uh, I guess we're likely to see, uh, is that a two, two? I guess, uh, what do you block this here? Like uh, BBD says yes, but what are, what are your thoughts on this block area? Yeah, I think you uh, somewhat priced into blocking in this spot. Also, I want to call out, we talked about the amulets going away, but Emrakul here means the amulets are still in the deck. So I wouldn't say Spike is out of win conditions. Okay, yeah, that's fair. We got one of them back in the deck, so, uh, you know, two, two left. But uh, this is a lot of pressure. This uh, this Caldra is it's quick, and there's no lands on Aspiring Spikes. All this work, and there's still not a land in play for Aspiring Spike. We're on turn, we're about to go into <laughs> turn five and have no permanence in play. What is this? Yeah, th th this is a pretty tough spot for Spike, and more than the Caldra, the thing that scares, uh, that would be scaring me in Spike's spot is that Raghavan. Once, once BBD starts to generate a mana advantage, then Spike loses any chance of coming back. There's Expressive Iteration, Teferi, there's just a pile of card advantage. The only thing that's been holding BBD back is that he can only leave up... Uh, play one or two pieces of interaction each turn. Once the Raghavan comes down, there's going to be cards drawn every turn and treasure generated every turn. That's going to put Spike really on the back foot because BBD is going to have the mana to answer everything he plays. Yeah, but by the way, this is lethal next... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, wrong life toll. But it's lethal in two turns probably here. And, you know, BBD's tapped out, but what are you worried about here? Uh, it's pretty hard to see this going badly for BBD. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good start, right? Get your opponent down to no permanence and play on turn six. Uh, exactly like we drew it up, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, so now we're going to go into uh, sideboarding. Uh, we, we, oh, this is nice. You get to see both players, so, so this is fantastic. Um, uh, what are your views here on kind of the ins and outs of, of each side and what each player is trying to accomplish? I think both spot the matchup gets significantly better for BBD. I would have, I would have guessed Spike was favored that game one despite how things turned out. But once we get into the sideboard and the Blood Moon and Magus of the Moon coming in, uh, the Spike's next primary game plan takes a pretty big hit. So he's going to want to be more converting towards something of a mid-range deck with some interaction for BBD's threats, while BBD is just going to be looking to do the same thing game one, but more efficient and but, but with more efficient interaction that lines up better in particular with stuff like these wear tears and blood moon effects. Yeah. By, the, by the way, those defense grids are staying in uh, Spike's sideboard. Um, w w so do you agree with that choice here? Obviously, there's counter spell in the deck. Uh, I believe there's some subtleties. So I, I, I am curious about that. But you know, a little bit weak against the current. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense when you think about BBD's deck as more of a mid-range deck that's looking to interact one for one, and Spike's deck is a ramp deck. So Spike really just wants to resolve some top end. Uh, sure, the combo aspect of his deck, not very good, like in that game one. But with stuff like Defense Grid, once you start going down cards, it becomes really hard to win in those long grindy games against mid-range decks. So it makes a lot of sense to opt to not go for that game one. Both bad. That's that's awesome insight, Arya. Thank you so much. And uh, now we're off to the races. Uh, two amulets of vigor in hand. We got the Golgari Rod Farm. We got the Lotus Field. Um, that might take a bit of time to deploy, but that's a lot of mana right away. Yeah, we could see as much as six mana next turn with amulet into double untap the Lotus Field in response to its own EGB. So all Spike needs to do is draw something that you know is a threat. Does that count? Go lost, tireless soldier. <laughs> I'd say go lost, cats. Yeah, that that's that seems good. Even even if you wanted to, right? There's still that dismember in hand for the Ragavan with the open that. If you need to, I don't even know if it's necessary here. Uh, but wait, no, yeah, this could be a crazy turn, right? Because I mean, you could stay with no lands with the field, but if you get go lost, then that untaps the land twice. Uh, and then you have Archdruid Charm. This could go crazy. Well, are there a lot? Did you see like how crazy these lines could go? Because clearly, Aspiring Spikes in pain. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty complicated spot. I don't think there's a way to activate Golos this turn, but there's certainly ways to act, to get a lot of mana. Spike, uh, I think it would make a lot of sense here for Spike to wait a little bit because there's not really much gained from playing out Golos this turn. Uh, but there's definitely lines where you play Golos, get another like Lotus Field or some other land, and then Archdruid's Charm for something. I, I like Spike's play here a lot, though, the discipline play of playing out Kulgari Rod Farm. 
And denying that mana generation from Raghavan, which we talked about, can be so important in this matchup. And just setting up to have a board where he can continue to make strong plays over the next few turns, rather than putting all the eggs in this one goalless basket. Yes. Because we don't see the card uh, in BBD's hand, but there were subtleties, right, in that side with this free and That would be a disaster to play Lotus Field here. Have your goalless. <laughs> You're like, oh, well, I guess this was a fun game of Magic. <laughs> BBD here draws a land, needed that pretty badly. There was a Lorian reveal for the second land, but having two mana up to counter something rather than not must feel a lot safer. Yeah. Now, in this spot, notably, I believe Spike could take some sort of convoluted line that would let him play Golos and activate it, but that line would still involve losing both, uh, both lands with Lotus Field. So again, really disciplined play, recognizing, okay, I need to play around counter magic. I can't just concede the game to that, particularly post mod. So it makes a lot of sense to wait on that. Right, of course. So, you know, if you decide not to kind of go for a turn one, going into two mana open makes a lot less sense. So, so yes, the, the patience makes sense. Uh, you also get access to nine mana next turn, right? With what's in play plus the Lotus Field. So um, get another draw step. Uh, what, what do you think about a little garden? I mean, a little difficult to, to run at the same time as Lotus Field, but. Yeah, I mean, a third amulet couldn't hurt, right? All the and amulets. The, and the nice thing about hitting that Raghavan on turn two with Dismember means there's not really any threats from BBD, so there's no so there's no rush. A Spiraling Spike can keep just improving his mana, making more amulets, and then eventually he's going to get to the point where he can play two, th two threats in the same turn. In the same turn. I think we're pretty close to the point where he can put Embracol into play. By the way, um, just a question, because in modern, like when to do things is, is relatively complex, just because there's a lot of timings, etc. And you mentioned wear tear aria, right? That was like one of the cyborg cards you highlighted. Like here, I guess not worried about wear tear if the plan is to copy an amulet, uh, just because the mana would be tapped down. Oh, wow. BBD not getting a land off expressive iteration. That's huge. Yeah, and th th this looks like game to me. Yeah, no, for sure. Gets to go Arch, Mage's Charm, new card from the latest set. Uh, oh, oh, Cultivator Colossus. This is going to be a lot of mana. So much mana. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so here we see the Lotus Field come into play and those three lovely untapped triggers going on the stack. Yeah, and we're really seeing the patience from Spike paying off. Because on this board state, uh, even if somehow BBD had a subtlety or multiple subtleties, this way Spike's still left with the Lotus Field. So there's really not any way this goes badly for him. He just says as much mana as he'll ever want. Oh, and one thing that's not in BBD's list, I believe, is Force of Negation. So this Timeless Lotus is very safe to land and I, I suspect end the game. Yeah, I have a hard time imagining BBD winning from this one. In fact, I have a hard time imagining BBD getting another turn from this point. Yeah, we will. I think BBD will get another turn, but that will be in game three only. As you know, you Aspire make a good point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as Aspire has seen Spike putting the finishing touches on the Golos. I mean, you get to put a lot of large creatures into play, get nothing good. You probably do get something. So, like, I mean, this, yeah, this, this is just looking uh, kind of. Uh, <laughs> like pretty over here. Yeah, even even if this goal is completely whiffs, there's a guarantee of at least two spells off this cultivator colossus. Yeah, so so speaking of whiffs, the first one was a whiff. Uh I see uh Arch may just charm uh, and another <laughs> amulet of vigor. Uh and no mana floating, but no I mean subtlety would have hit that Golos probably. So we're seeing yeah. oh my, oh this is fantastic. And this is, I think, the point at which an Emrakul is pretty likely to be put onto the battlefield. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Just call it. <laughs> yeah, it's just a matter of how much BBD wants to let Spike show off there. Yeah, he's had enough. He feels like there was enough uh, uh, enough uh, mana, cards, everything being generated. So, so that's lovely. A little different from game one where there were no permanents. This was kind of like no permanents or all the permanents. Uh, so now we're moving on to, to game three. I, I'm suspecting that there's no difference play draw here, Arya, but um, may, maybe something 
that that could come up. Ooh. Yeah, it makes a little more sense for defense crits to come in turn one on the come in on the draw. On the draw, you have one more card, so you're less worried about getting run out of cards and getting out mid ranged. And on the play, there's some chance you go off turn two. Uh, BBD's mana is going to be awkward trying to deploy threats, so you're going to have more intervals to play around counter spells even without the defense grid. But on the draw, BBD is going to have a lot more flexibility to leave up counter magic. And that means defense grid no longer, uh, defense grid has a lot more relevant text. Fair enough. So we see a mulligan here from BBD. But Fred, heavy hand. Uh, not a lot of answers, just going to have to hope that Spike reads those answers where they don't exist. But, you know, turn one Ragavan, turn two Stoneforge. Mystic on the play. A lot of miracles can happen. Um, although we have one of the best possible answers to that Ragavan. Yeah, this may be one of the best Arboreal Grazers I've seen in my life. BBD's head has no threat. And this Grazer is both going to just gum up the ground and going to let Spike start making Saga tokens, which are pretty credible threats. So, honestly, one of the most impressive slots I've ever seen. I mean, I mean, so so the uh, I remember playing MH2 uh, limited, and hard evidence was, you know, super important in case your your opponent did have the Ragavan. It was kind of uh, <laughs> the strength of the O3 cannot be understated. And yes, here we get Stoneforge Mystic getting Kelker complete. So really going. I'm not trying to grind here. I'm trying to win the game as fast as possible. Yeah, it's. A slightly awkward spot, I think, for uh, for BBD, where at this point, next turn, Spike is going to have access to two amulets with the uh, uh, with the Saga and the Microsynth Gardens. So any threat off the top is basically game. But at the same time, BBD isn't really regressing his game plan in any way. So if he just sits around and waits, Spike can just start making Saga tokens, maybe get an Expedition map to get another Saga, and that's also pretty problematic. Yes, yes, that's that's important that how Versus Saga essentially allows you to, to play around counter magic. Um, something we haven't seen a little bit in a while as, as, the, as a lot of the, the modern metagame has been developed to be on board. Uh, we've seen a bit less of Urza Saga, but make no mistake, when you start looking at older formats like Vintage and Legacy, Urza Saga against those Force of Will decks makes them look like a joke sometimes. <laughs> uh, as VBD here plays Expressive Iteration, gets another one in hand. Uh, a, there we go. We get the land off the Express. You know, Arya, when you don't get that land off Expressive Iteration, it's just so painful. Yeah, that's one of the worst feelings there is. <laughs> oh, wow. Drew an Amulet of Vigor from Spike. Uh, so, so, by the way, uh, in this spot area, Spike has it all in terms of mana. You got the Gruel Turf, you got the many amulets, a Vigor. What, but you have nothing to go with it. So, so, so kind of what is the, the setup we're looking up? I think at this point, you really just want to find more threats. In fact, in Spike's position, I may have even considered getting a uh, Expedition map there rather than an amulet, just so that you can get another Urza Saga, get more threats. But the thing is that second Amulet of Vigor is really key when you have those Microsynth Gardens. The first one, if it gets Prismatic Ending, then your Microsynth Gardens are no longer threats. But with two around, it's pretty hard for BBD to actually put Spike off Amulet for the rest of this game. And I'd say that leaves Spike in at least a decent spot. Yeah, uh, and, and BBD here respecting kind of the potential of Spike's hand. I mean, Spike had free cards going into four. You know, there could easily be two threats and more than enough mana to pay for them, but um yeah i mean this uh construct token might become really important uh simply because it's i mean look if you want to keep your mana up bbd here take it <laughs> taste taste the free damage yeah i think this is one of the spots where we start to see uh an unfortunate downside of this timeless amulet deck as compared to stock amulet one of the issues in a matchup like this is that Normally, when the game's going along, they're sitting there with counter spells in hand, eventually go draw a cavern of souls to your primeval titan. And Spike admittedly does not have that inevitability. There is going to uh it's there is going to at uh, no point be a spot where he just has threats he can't that can't be countered unless he manually gets to the 15 mana for Emrakul. <laughs> well, that'd be lovely. Wouldn't that be lovely? Uh, by the way, we see here uh, BBD playing Expressive Iteration, putting Snapcaster Mage into hand. 
uh, a very different modern format to the one a lot of you might be used to at home, but one which we all would have hoped for potentially. I mean, some people uh, <laughs> don't like this kind of thing. But by the way, Aria there, like that was a change, right? Last turn we saw BBD keep four mana up, having nothing really. Like if, if there's nothing to counter, there was nothing to do. But this turn, deciding to play out the expressive iteration, what do you think changed here? I think BBD recognized that some point he's got to win this game. He just can't wait here infinitely for Spike to find something. And the fact that Spike didn't go for something, even with all that mana, is to me some at least a little bit of a sign that maybe Spike's out of action. I think there's also a recognition that, oh, that saga hit me, and now I'm down to a single-digit life total, and I need to do something about it. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I only saw one attack, so BDD kind of uh, more to blame for his for his life total than a spike, I would say. Uh, very much so, yeah. Uh, and here we see, yes, the gardens copying the amulet of vigor twice, so one each time. Um, and uh, I guess I guess we're not seeing like you know obviously the the wear here because oh my, that, that's Emrigo. <laughs> oh my, so so. Um, is this enough? So is this enough mana? I think with our Royal Grazer, it yeah. is. This is easily enough mana if the Grazer resolves. So, so if you're BBD, would you counter the Grazer here? I mean, I would definitely counter it after a bounce land has been played. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It might have been interesting to see Spike lead with the Grazer, because I, then I, you don't have that information. I, I think so, too. It's a little That's a little bit of a strange sequence, indeed. Um, unless, you know, you're trying to get something else into play, but then you would have just played it rather than this Grazer, so will BBD read it? No! And that's probably going to be it, right? Because you play your last land, you get the mana up, back to 15, hard cast that Emrakul, can't be countered, get that extra turn, can't target it. Classic play as if, you know, I mean, putting Emrakul into play for its mana cost, something that we don't see that often anymore, but it's a modern classic, but it's Aspiring Spike delivering it and not BBD. Yeah, I mean, honestly, hot gust, Emrakul, good, honest living. Glad we get to see that on stream. By the way, the, the, the audience, you know, chat is like, oh, you don't counter Grazer in that spot. There's too much stuff. What, what are you, you I, I mean, it's possible that that play is correct, too. It's, it's a really hard call, right?